Welcome to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart podcast. Doing business in life with a purpose, serving others, and achieving success in both your personal and professional life. I'm your host, Steve Ramona. We create this show for you because we want everyone to learn and be inspired how to serve in your business and in your life so you can make an impact in the world. I'm excited, excited to share these incredible stories with you. I want you to think about who you serve today and what impact will you make today. And my guest today is becoming a close, close friend, friend, but a business partner that has the same alignment about business that I do and this podcast has. Jim, welcome to the show. Steve, thanks for having me on, man. I'm looking forward to it. Servant leader. What the heck is that in your eyes? Servant leader. Gosh, there's so many terms that just get thrown around so much that they just lose their flavor uh, and they become old hat. But if you if you're really tapping into it, um, servant leadership is is all about going first. It, mm -hmm. Servant leadership is all about setting the pace for people, um, and you know it, it's being able to ins what what I call it becoming the leader that people will follow willingly. And you know a lot of people follow you because you got positional uh, leadership. A lot of people follow you because maybe you have influence and they want to be seen with you. But do they follow you willingly? Yeah. That's a big word there because there's a lot of people follow on the social media and, oh, Stephen always got, I don't, but a hundred million followers. He must be good. Right. I could be, I could not, but you got to watch out for that. Let's throw in mentors or mentorship in that. Is that important to you? Uh, the capacity for it is, um, I, well, I do find, um, I think I learned this more in my, my sports background, you know, I, Sports saved my life growing up in an abusive environment. The one place I got acceptance and really love as I was growing up was on the ball field. The harder I worked, the more praise I got, the more recognition I got. Uh, it it went that way. And, and I was not, as a kid, the rah-rah motivational leader. I led by example. And so people often followed me because I was willing to go that extra mile with them. Um and I've seen some incredible leaders who don't speak much. And so they they mentor by action. But yes, overwhelmingly, you know, you, you want to be able to, to speak into people's world. I, I think that's what, what a great leader can do is, is, is effectively uh, impact change by asking great questions and sharing powerful truths. I love that. And it reminds me of seeing you in high school. And I love the bridge. I go back, the bridge between sports and business. I think it's vital. And I know we're sports guys, but, you know, varsity high school baseball, I didn't play. Decided to play football four years and quit. Mm -hmm. I didn't play sophomore, junior. So I went out and coach said, we really don't have a chance. But I remember hustling my butt. And he came to me, he goes, you know why you made the team? Because you took action and worked your butt off, which now leads to my life and, and you know, working and doing different things. Tell me your bridge between sports and business. You got into a little bit. Let's get into a little deeper. Yeah. You know, like I said, it saved my life. So I just had a different relationship with it. It wasn't optional for me. It was, I just, I recognized that the more I put into it, the more I got out of it. And I learned something that I didn't really identify until maybe 10 years ago, but I, I lived it. I just couldn't explain it, but I love working with athletes because they have an extreme understanding and awareness to maximum preparation for a little bit of go time. You know, you watch a football player, like you said, football, you, you know, you're going to practice 25, 30 hours a week for the opportunity to get on the field for a seven second play. And that might be all you get that day. That takes an insane amount of mental preparation and focus. And, uh, and, and I love that perspective because too many people, especially in, in the sales game and entrepreneurship, everybody has this perspective of equal ROI. If I put in an hour, I want at least an hour's out worth of outcome. Uh, I don't know how that, that's not a math formula that I see works very often. Mm -hmm. Many times you got to be willing to put in 10 to get one, but that one can be powerful. Right. And if you're not willing to, then somebody else is. Yeah. That's a big key. Somebody behind you is going to work harder than you, work smarter, do all the right things, and they're going to go right by you. Yeah. And so I, I tend to lean towards people who have military background 
or a sports or a high performance background. Like you can be a dancer or a, mm -hmm. a you know, musician, a high competitive, somebody who understands it, a lot of preparation to get to the one moment. And then that just becomes a, a lifestyle. Yeah. Discipline is a word that comes to my head as you're talking. Is kind of that where you're going with this? Yeah. Well, I think that's the byproduct. I think that's mm -hmm. the, um, that's the, um, that's the skill set. You know, that's the muscle that you're working in that process. I think it develops discipline when, with that perspective, because, and, but it's always attached to something more. Part of the reason that I could, I, you know, I spent half of my childhood grounded. And so I'd be in my bedroom, throwing a baseball up in the air. And I, I would 800 times a night before I'd go to bed, I would leave, watch the, the scene, watch the baseball, leave the fingertips off the seams, the exact right way, you know, and all of that stood, showed up when I was on the field and you know, I never threw the ball away. I always hit the first baseman right where he could catch it um, because I practice it all the time. And then I visualize it all the time, you know, and every time I was, every time we, you know, played in my room or played with my brother or played anywhere, you know, I, I we practiced the game winning play three, two, one, mm -hmm. as you dive in across the end zone or, you know, making the play. And we see that stuff so many times people think it's just fantasy, but when your brain sees it happen over and over again, your brain believes it's real. Your subconscious doesn't know the difference between real uh, and, and fiction. It just knows what you feel as the result. Yeah, so then it yeah. manages those feelings and you get into these pressure situations. And I was like, hey, game on the line, bottom of the ninth, two out, yeah, hit the ball to me, man. I, w I was willing to look like the goof yeah. for the opportunity to make the game winning play. You are talking my language because we hear athletes, Tom Brady, <laughs> All the time when they win the Super Bowl, yeah, I dreamed this as a kid. I played that winning Super Bowl pass or yep. Barry Bonds, you know, in my area where we are from this, you know, in the same area, hitting that home run. But bridge that now to 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 business. You know, business owners listening going, I'm not a big sports guy. I, I like watching it or whatever, but how's that helping my business? It's it's vital to have a healthy, powerful loving relationship with preparation. Hmm. You need to understand how important it is. Uh, if you, the less time you put into preparation and cleanup, I'm preparing to me, it's both on the front and the back end. Mm -hmm. So if you have a presentation you're going to do or a sales conversation uh, or an interview, what are the questions you want to ask? What are the answers you want to bring in? This isn't about showing up rehearsed because I'm not about that. But, you, you know, think through what stories might you tell? What, you know, because you may not get to them, but you, but thinking through them will put you in a different state, um, making sure that you understand that the preparation is part of the delivery. Yeah. Right. Well, I used to own an alarm company and we had technicians that would be out in the field and, uh, you know, installing panels. And we used to have two major problems with, with techs. One is they don't inventory their, their equipment. Well, you can open up the van and there's Clips and magnets and wires all over the place. And, oh, man, I'm just seeing dollar signs. Yeah. Right? Well, and then the other is they don't, they're technicians. They're not report guys, right? They want to climb in attics and do stuff. And yeah. then when they get, then they come to the office and they realize, oh, I forgot to check this box. Now they got to go <laughs> back to the client's house yeah. and do the job. And then, you know, and it's a trip charge. So it's not for them. They, they think they're going to bill us a trip charge. Like, no, not if it was your negligence. Right. So what we did was we installed a process where the install the installation wasn't complete until the mm -hmm. report was complete. So now they would install the panel. They would sit in the truck in the driveway or on the street until the report was completed. Then they got to say install done. Very because cool. that was part of their cleanup, part of their post call opportunity, part of their preparation. And they had to go. So if you had, if it was going to take you 90 minutes to install this job, you needed to allow uh, 45 minutes, you know, or excuse me, an extra 15 minutes yeah. you know, to do the, to, to the prep for and go, because you had to make sure that you don't just go, Oh yeah, I think I have that on the truck. Your job was to, to check the truck, to ensure you had all the necessary components for the job. Cause you didn't want to drive across town to go install it and find out you didn't bring the extra siren that they wanted or the extra motion detector or whatever it was. So everything was designed to be prepped ahead of time. And now as a company business owner, we had to pay them for that. Because yep. I can, if, if I say, this is what we want you to do, but they're like, yeah, but I only get paid when I hang a panel. So we had to increase 
by seven dollars every single trip. Yeah. So that they would they would recognize they were doing it. So it takes that it takes a mentality to understand the all of the extra preparation that goes into that. Yep. To, to make that happen. And the greatest tip you just gave is how important systems are in business. Yes. How much money do you think you saved having a better system? Thousands. Yeah. And that, that's it's not a few few dollars. It's a lot of money that it's ancillary costs across the board because yeah. most people don't think about it. Back then, there were several things. Number one, phone bills were long distance, you know, back then for those <laughs> young people who don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> and then gas. We were spending, you know, we were averaging, you know, forty five hundred dollars a month yeah. on gas bills. And so if somebody had to cross town, even though the trip charge, we weren't going to pay them for the extra trip, we still had to pay the gas. Yeah. So it's costly back out there. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just all the little stuff. And then you start recognizing that, okay, in order to manage all of this, we needed, you know, another admin support. But we saved so much money in waste that it more than paid for the admin. Yeah. So you were smart, smart business, working smart, always going to save you money, then working longer and harder. Right. Got to do that sometimes. I, I want to dive into your podcast. I was on it yesterday. I appreciate being on opportunity makers we hear the word opportunity all the time hey steve hey jim you have this opportunity this product but i love the maker part let's delve into that what your thought process is with that well the opportunity maker is actually something i've kind of always fancied myself mm -hmm. um you know again growing up in a, in a in a hard challenging environment as a kid i didn't have a lot of personal self-worth i always had to fight for my validation and so I started, I took on this perspective that the more things I can create for other people would give me value. And so I would make opportunities for other people. You know, this was my, I, I had many, many entrepreneurial ventures as a kid, but in, in junior high, um, I loved literature and we did Greek mythology studies and all this other stuff. And I loved that stuff. And we would have to write book reports on it. And I would write a book report and be so, you know, colorful that you know i will get a lot of praise for it and then i would have friends go hey man can you write mine <laughs> right and then i but i didn't want to write them all like me yeah. so i had i would find other guys who could write it and take a different spin on it so i would get paid you know pay me the 10 bucks i would give you know eight of it to my other friend who wrote it i made two bucks just for facilitating the deal but i created an opportunity there right i was always looking for anything i did was always like how can this benefit somebody else and believe though this was not because i was altruistic it was because i was so needing love yeah. that this was how i made myself valuable to multiple people the person i got to be the hero for by, by writing the report facilitating the report getting done and then the other person i got to also be connected because I was a jock. I was popular, all, all that yeah. stuff. And most of the guys who I worked with on this stuff were not. This was how they became useful and valuable to the jock guys, to the jock community and important. Right. So I was just like, how many people can I include in this so that they would all love me? That was really my whole thing as a kid. The win, win, win we talk about. You know, it's interesting. You sound like you were a human AI back then. You took a report, right? I, I don't know if you thought about that, but you're talking like you took the report, but I changed a few words, a few paragraphs to make it different. Um, I, I love it. It's and we learn about things like that as we talk. Right. Again, another word that I learned yesterday, how you use valuable. Let's talk about that because I think it's very powerful. Yeah. Um, this was a, a, a I'll share the, the story with you real quickly. You, you, you know, you hear it on on the on the podcast that we talked about yesterday, but uh, I got, I had somebody that sent me a, an email and he was a YouTube expert and he was wanting to provide some insights to me that would make him unique. So he reached out and said, Hey, I have, uh, I'm, I, I want to look at your YouTube channel. I see some things and I, I would see some really simple improvements that you can make. If you're open to it, I'll send you a video. I said, sure. He sent me a six minute video. This was the key. It wasn't a 60 minute video, it was six, six minute video. So I actually watched it. And he literally took my my YouTube channel and a couple of videos specifically, made some great recommendations. I have started and I've saved it and I'm going, we're going to actually implement on it. And then after the first year, we're probably going to hire his company. But in the meantime, somebody else had asked me about some YouTube stuff. And I said, dude, watch this video and, and, and reach out to him. Right. So I got, I got a referral to him. But what I noticed was most people give you value. 
They say, hey, here's my book or here's my case study or here's my 60 minute video on this. And I'm like, that's cool, man. But I don't want to watch your 60 minute video. This guy gave me something that was actually valuable. It wasn't just him delivering value. It was him being valuable to me because it was short, specific, simple, actionable, and it made a difference. Right. Value is what you have. Valuable is the action of taking your value and, and, and delivering it to somebody else like he did with you. Right. Right. Mm, and we it. all can do that no matter what. Yeah. It's like anytime you think you're going to share a piece of information, ask yourself, is this valuable? How will they see it as valuable? I guarantee you it's a value. You're delivering value. I, yeah. No, no question. But is this valuable to them? And how will you define that so that you're always giving actionable content in that format? Yeah, I love it. And let's top in the valuable when you say this question, when I, when did you realize the solution, uh, you had the solution for many businesses that they didn't know they need it? Yeah, that's a tough one, man, because when they don't know they need it, it's hard to sell it sometimes, yeah. <laughs> right? Because they, it's, it's not about them understanding that they have a problem. Most people stop there. And, you know, I, I'll use weight gain. I'm in the process, uh, you know, some we're coming some diabetes and some high blood pressure stuff. And so I, I've been dropping weight and working on stuff. But it took me a long time because I was aware that I was overweight for a while. But just because I had the pain of being overweight doesn't mean I was ready to solve the problem. And just because I was aware of the problem, I, I was aware of the risks. So a lot of times people say, well, once they understand the pain, they'll do something about it. No, I have an incredibly high pain tolerance. So I can endure all kinds of stupid stuff. And I have, and I did for years. I finally reached a point of disgust. And I said, I got to do something about this because I'm shame on me. I'm a grandpa. I got five grandkids now. I want to live another 50 years. Yeah. Right. So I had to be at a place where I had was problem aware, I was consequence aware, and I was actually ready to do something about it. So your job is to, to remain relevant and valuable in people's world so that when they're ready, you're the logical conclusion. It's not about showing them constantly all the pain. It's about being present and sharing with them that you understand their journey and that you know what happens along the journey and you, know, you can remind them that the longer they wait to start this the harder it's going to be to dig out but you get it and you're aware and you're here and you're on the journey and so we we did that was really the main thing for us was just being incredibly aware incredibly visible you know being in people's worlds join communities be a community focused business so that it's not you, you're not relying on putting an ad to the right person at the right time about the right message at the very day they need it. Cause how the heck would you know that? You wouldn't. Right. But if you're, if you're in somebody's world, they get to see over and over again, you, they get to see over and over again, people you've helped. They get to hear from other people about you. And so it's this journey. And then at some point they're like, you know, I really like you. And when I'm ready for your service, you're the guy I'm going to hire because I like yeah. you. And I feel like I can trust you. I've seen it. Right. So you have to be, you have to make sure that you're putting that forward. And that was hard for me because I was a reluctant leader. I didn't want to, we, our whole business model was built on being behind people, helping elevate businesses. Mm -hmm. And now we're at a place where, you know, we're getting front and center and stage. Um, and it's hard to talk about, you know, I mean, we've generated nearly a half a billion dollars worth of sales for people. I hate saying that because it feels so self aggrandizing. Yeah, but it's not. And it's, it, it, there's value to everything. If you have value, you bring in value and you're valuable. Let's use that again. Right. 100,000, 10,000, doesn't matter what that value is. That's what people are paying. They're doing it every day. They're walking to a grocery store. I need, you know, cereal. That's valuable to me. That's how we need to look at it. Talking about sales, because we've talked about it too, as being the dirty word, sales and, and, and making decisions. What's your quick synopsis? Somebody says, well, how do I handle sales? Yeah, uh, here's the, the the beauty is that you don't have to be a sales expert to sell. And at the same time, you've been selling your whole life. Mm -hmm. So the problem is most people are too busy trying to teach you all these things to do. And what we really need to do is get all of those things out of the way and just have you show up as the same person who influences your kids every day to eat broccoli before they have cake, mm -hmm. to do their homework before they watch TV, to get your husband to, uh, you know, to marry you, to get your wife to say yes to you, uh, to get your friends to go to Chinese instead of Mexican, 
right? You do this every single day of your life. You stand up, you share value, you speak truth to people, you tell them what's going on, you inspire them to want to do it, and then they do something. Yeah, They either do it or they don't. It's no different than you being in your business every single day. The problem is you get into a sales environment and you think you're supposed to be something. So you put on this hat and you go, I am a salesperson. I must sell to people today. I must share my product. I'm, it's like, no, 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 just, just do you. Because yeah. nothing you will ever do that will be more enrolling or influential than you being the most optimal version of yourself. Golden nuggets are flying out of you, Jim, like crazy. <laughs> and I want to bridge that sales discussion to decision. Yes. Because you said that. I said, okay, it's good. I'm going to buy this product, service, whatever it may be. Let's talk about that road of indecisiveness. Man, this is a big one. Uh, I've been doing a lot of of, of uh, studying around this uh, of late because it's such a psychological journey that people are on when, when they're in a deciding process. And everybody has their own process for making decisions. They just don't know it. Like everybody, you go to some sort of craziness in your head when you make a decision of any significance. And what most people don't recognize, first of all, is the actually the word, the root word of, of decision is to cut off, right? Mm -hmm. To decide. So to make a decision is to cut off all other options, right? Uh, pesticide is to kill off all the pests, right? Genocide, you know. To, on on, yeah. <laughs> right? Everything is to kill off. So when you make a decision, you're literally killing off all other options for now. It doesn't mean you never do this other thing. You're just saying for this moment, I've decided this. That means I'm not going to do that. I'm doing this because everything we do comes at a cost. So by me being here right now, it means I'm not at the gym or I'm not on a team meeting or I'm not with my wife or I'm not with my client because I'm here. Mm -hmm. I can only be in one spot. So to do this, I've decided and cut off all of the options for where I'll be this hour. And that's the, the, the thing that we're helping people do. You have to help them see that it's worth cutting off all other options besides you for this season, for this yeah. journey to solve this problem. Yeah. And it's that it's so well said because once you're aware back to that word that you're cutting these things, they're not going away. They're just, you're going to see your wife later. You're going to see your team. You know, it's so well said because indecisiveness, I believe is evil to business. It People is. go, oh, I'm not going to decide right now. You just, slowed the process down the energy out in the universe just make a decision because you always recover from it right but even that if you decide not to make a decision what you've done is you've cut off the option of making decisions yeah it's not yeah. good <laughs> right that that is not how things work and, and here's the beauty of it is every single decision is recoverable yeah. you can make it to another decision tomorrow with new information so instead of well i gotta wait till i get all the information just make a decision today with what yeah. information you have on hand when you receive new information that is worthy of a different decision, then you can make it at that time. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And let's dive into your accomplishments. You've done a lot and you're so humble about it, but how'd you know you're world-class after looking at everything you've done? Oh, uh, largely because I had to have it told to us many times. I, I didn't believe it. I think we all challenge it. But mm -hmm. I love Cindy and I, my wife, we, we don't watch a ton of TV, but we like to watch the, like the performance shows, like, like America's Got Talent, like The Voice. I love watching those competitions and stuff. And it's, uh, it's always fascinating to me. I watch these people singing on The Voice. They're incredible. All of them. They're all incredible. Especially when you get down to the finale and it never fails. Every single episode of every single show, they eliminate somebody. And the person who didn't get eliminated every time always looks relieved and surprised because yeah. they don't, I'm watching, I'm going, dude, this guy's great. Yeah. And he goes, next, moving on to the next round is Steve Ramona. And he's like, oh my God, I can't believe they chose because yeah. they're, they're yeah. floored. They're like, how could they have chosen me? I'm like, how could they have not? What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right? that's... Because they never see themselves in, as the greatness. Right. They get very humble, very real in the moment because they see that there's an opportunity they could have messed up. Right. And it's this, I think we all see that in ourselves. We're, we're, we're reluctant to step in the spotlight and claim it yeah. for ourselves. And so that's been a big challenge for me. It's just, like I said, I was a reluctant leader, but I just had to start looking at, um, you know, here, when, when, let me give you this. When, when people hire me to come in and do sales training, 
Like if I come into a corporation, do a sales team, somebody, I don't go in and start teaching sales tactics, <laughs> which is what most people do. Because you already know how to sell or you wouldn't be here, most likely. And on some sort of skill set, you can do this. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, you stopped selling or you need, you know, you've lost belief in the product. You've lost faith in yourself. You, don't, you Something's going on. So the first thing that we typically do, and I would recommend you guys do this, take when you go to a sales meeting, the first thing you should do is read off all of their case studies. Talk about this client success, this client journey, this win, this five-star report, all of these things. Because you know what? Now the team starts, A, having faith and remembering, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, those were good. That was good. And they start believing. They go, oh, wow, look at this report Steve just got. That was awesome. Steve, you rock. Hey, and now all of a sudden, faith starts arising. Yeah. Belief starts showing up. And you remember why this matters. And it's no different for you as an entrepreneur. As a solopreneur, as a business owner, you should never get on a phone call. I you need to, I, I tell people all the time, place them on your wall. Print out case studies, print out testimonials, print out anything somebody says, capture everything that someone says good about you, about you, the result, the community, the environment, the experience, the opportunity. Put it on the wall and read it to yourself every day and yeah. remind yourself how many, how many how good you are, what you do. Because I focus on all the things I've done wrong. I focus on them every day. And that stuff can cripple you yeah. in your growth. Yeah. And so I have to counter it with all the blessings of the good stuff that people have said about me, praised about, or the results that we've gotten, the places I've been invited to, the stages I've been asked to speak on, all of this stuff. And it's humbling and it's honoring, but you need to wear it. I have to look at it and go, yeah, I'm pretty good at this. Yeah, yeah. And the humbleness is great. And, and I love the fact that you focus on the positive because every business, most businesses like, here's our quotas. We're, do, we're supposed to do a million dollars this month. We only did 900,000. I'm like, Hey, you did 900,000. That's pretty awesome. Let's, let's celebrate that. The hundred thousand will fix till next month. Yeah. But people don't do that. Yeah. Do you know, Ian garlic? No, I'm going to introduce him to you. I uh, actually, he's a good friend of mine. Um, uh, I refer him to a lot. We, we refer to each other on a lot of podcasts and stuff, but I, we just met with him a few minutes ago and he's got a company called Video Case Story. And the mm. whole focus is using videos to tell stories of what your clients are doing. And that becomes like, that's his whole sales process. That's his marketing. It's his messaging. It's what leads people. And so at the time they get to you, they're, they're darn near sold because they've seen all these other clients winning and different ways you've helped. And, they, and you use those case stories to talk about your process and how it works and stuff. And so one of the things he was just to show, we just did this uh, um, session with him and his team. And one of the things that he put our action items is to go back all the last 10 years and just list every client we've worked with, all the clients we've won with. And, you know, and I thought, you know what, my, well, my wife and I just talked about it right after that. I said, not only the ones we did, that we didn't do well. I mean, not the ones that we won with, but some of the ones that we didn't do well, because even in those, there were great lessons and there was always something we did good. So we're literally going to list every single one of them. And then we're just going to break down story, 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 and using those stories to, again, market and message and sell with, but also to sell us and remembering how awesome we have done the people, you know, because it hasn't all just been us. We've had 500 salespeople, you know, work for us uh, and those people have helped us change lives for our clients. We've had teams and project managers and team leaders and event captains and everybody that we've been putting together and to help build all these systems and structures we have. And they've delivered millions of dollars worth of outcomes and incredible amounts of change and success for people. And so it's the ability to, you know, one of my core gifts is the ability to attract amazing people and opportunities into my life. Yeah, that's so great. I, I love that. We're right out of time here, Jim. Talk about the pie. How can people get the podcast and how can they connect with you? Yeah, uh, the, the Opportunity Makers podcast that we were just talking about, um, that one is my newest venture and I'm really excited about it. And the reason that I put it together is uh, I've been very, very blessed to work with millionaires and billionaires and do and be, be around a lot of very successful people. And people just move through space and time differently. Mm -hmm. And they see things differently. And then you're in the world and you're seeing people are fearful. You got inflation, you got gas prices, you got egg prices, you got weirdness going on in politics and in the economy and everything. And it's really easy to start circling the wagons and start retracting. And I don't want that. 
Because while you're doing that, people are seizing opportunities all around you. And I just want to bring hope and inspiration. And so that podcast is about, we've interviewed a lot of people who exited companies, gone public, done some really big things. And because they just see the world differently. And I just want to bring hope and inspiration. So when you listen to the Opportunity Makers podcast, you just take the way that they see the world, the way that people are moving and say, you know what? All these problems around me are nothing but opportunities waiting to be seized. So I love it. enjoy that journey. Yeah. Um, check it out. Comment on it. Let us know how what you think about it. Yeah. And really excited about that. Yeah. And you, you want to talk about real quick, what's the other podcast? Yeah. The other Basically. one is the Sales Team Ready podcast. And that is specifically focused on all things sales and scaling. And that was the conversation we had yesterday with Steve that his episode will be going up on the Sales yeah. Team Ready podcast. And it's it's good, sound wisdom. A lot of it is me sharing insights, breaking down strategies, and interviewing people who are experts in the sales and scaling game. We had a great conversation yesterday just on yeah. building relationships to grow business yesterday. And so I'm really looking forward to that one to come out. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you, Jim, for being on. This has been fantastic. Um, I want everybody to keep in mind, watch this over and over again. There's so many golden nuggets Jim put out there. My notepad's full, which is great. I always have a full notepad. That means I got a lot of information, which is what these are all about. I look forward to seeing you all on my next episode of Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. And keep in mind, I'm launching a serving journal where you can track every day you're serving people and learn how to grow with your serving ability. We'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks again.